by building this habit of finding out yourself, this is what you need when we're in purples and brown belts, you know, that mm -hmm. you need to solve ability to believe even that you can solve your own problems. And it starts with giving small tasks to white belt and, you know, giving them most of the answers, but also letting them a little bit suffer. Not like, you know, they have to yeah. figure out jujitsu on their own, like totally, but uh, always like, what do you think? And then, okay, well, I think this and that, and oh, actually, you know, this is almost right and do this. Oh, yeah. There's arguments that why don't you just give them the answer? It's easier. It's quicker. But then for longevity, you will bite yourself in ass, so to speak, that you will have people around that everything is given. And then uh, by but encouraging people to solve problems themselves. And then, like you said, longevity is like uh, if they understand why they did it, you know, they they do it themselves. Uh, it sticks with them longer. And then you don't have those things that, oh, what was the sweep yesterday we did, you know? Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm talking to Preet Mickelson, or as he prefers, Grand Sifu Sensei, Grandmaster Preet. So thank you so much for coming down from the Shaolin Temple and uh, and talking to us normal human beings today, Preet. Well, <laughs> that was a good introduction. Yeah, I prefer like some some ridiculous signs like a god or whatever. So, yeah. well, like, you, uh, yeah. you're on my friend uh, Steve Kwan's podcast recently, and I think you said it's Preet or it's God and nothing in between. Yeah, so you know, I'm coming from also traditional uh, backgrounds, and and uh, in some point I had enough. Uh, but there were always that you know, Si Hing brother, Si Fu father, and Si Gung was a grand you know granddad or. And everybody, adult men, had to play that you will call other adult men, you know, weird names. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess I had enough and I feel uh, certain titles if, uh, you know, right now also this kind of what we had in mental models. A uh, little bit ignite, uh, uh, I guess, conversation with on people that or amongst people that what do I mean and and why I'm against uh, titles. And uh, many people actually are you know, also writing on Instagram under the mental model stuff that oh it's just prof, uh, teacher in portuguese and mm -hmm. uh, for many people it seems like simple problem but for me it's really like a misleading well and, that, uh, so yeah. that's because the term professor means teacher in portuguese so we should use yeah. the term professor imagine if we were studying indonesian martial arts and the indonesian word for teacher just happened to be transcendent god but in english right whoa and so now I'm supposed to call you transcendent God Preet just because it's the Indonesian term. Like, I, or if the term for teacher in Indonesian translates to asshole, right? I'm supposed to call you yeah. asshole Preet. Like, no, just because it's a, let, a word in a different language doesn't mean we have to bring it over into English. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I, I'm actually a little bit jokingly uh, considering that it's intentional because, um, and I feel it's it's not honest. And, uh, you know, if Portuguese is a teacher in professor, so in English, it's a, it's a teacher is a teacher. So why not, you know, that, but I think it changes totally the meaning. And uh, if, uh, if people are that kind of blind or whatever, oh, it's only a, you know, professor is a teacher, then it's, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's a small thing, but that's how things are sneaked in a little bit. And, and uh, and I think I don't even I actually wanted to have a discussion. Maybe you can tell me that why what why it is like a sports, let's say, called there's a head coach and a coach. And uh, why is let's if you teach geography or something, why they're called more teacher? It's not like basketball teacher. You have a basketball coach. Mm -hmm. So I feel like in jiu-jitsu, they want to make it look more like it means more than the sport. You know, it's a life. It's a it's a life circle in jiu-jitsu. You learn something about life and it, they want to make it more special. So teacher and a professor or whatever makes them look a little bit bigger than they are. And if you say it's just a coach, I think I feel like they feel it's like a diminishing their value because they're teaching something more than just uh, being a coach. But at the same time, it's the teacher and the coach. I think it's a little bit the same thing, you know, or I don't like I always said, I think in a, the, the mental model stuff also. You know, Michael Jordan's coach is Pill Jackson, yeah? Mm -hmm. And he still is called, you know, coach, not a professor coach or, you know, still a head coach, whatever. And it's not diminishing because it's the work he does and everybody understands he's a great guy. But there's no titles in those sports that you have a, like a master master coach or, you know, 
I know that divers have you know master master something. They have degrees, whatever they have to do. You you earn the skill level, and I guess they have structured it. But in sports, it's not. If and, I go uh, if I go take a diving course with a very best diver who's like master diver, I don't know what the terms are, but I don't call yeah. him master diver John or master diver Smith. That's just a. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit like <laughs> I don't know chiropractors who want to be called doctor as well. I mean, come on, doc or. Or engineers who have their doctorate in engineering. They don't run around calling themselves Dr. Smith. So Yeah, like engineer Smith or it's like but yeah, so it's a it's a weird topic and I think it's a little bit touchy and jujitsu world is, you know, influenced by that and it's uh, I think it's fun to have a discussion. And uh, in a way, irritate people so they would think uh, is it right or wrong or some people just don't care. But um, at least in my field, I'm not like, you know, Political. I don't go rally here and there. So I feel jiu-jitsu is my field, so to speak. And I, I and I feel if I have a really like a you know thought out thoughts that uh, now if I have a more also like opportunity to speak out, I, I would use that and also be very careful what I say because you know I can have misunderstanding going on very quickly. So so I I think I'm not. I'm not misunderstanding the idea. I can speak out and I have to stand by it and take the criticism and open discussion. And so, uh, so I, I, I like that because I haven't seen, uh, you know, not many people talking about those things. Uh, and it seems like, you know, I, I mentioned in a Sony Brown breakdown that I talk about clapping and why I don't like clapping. The one, two, and three. What it, yeah. What it represents. And, and, uh, so Sony was also like, I never heard somebody resisted tr tr uh, clapping and then uh, and asking why would we, would, would we even clap? And it seems like I can ask weird question that people actually says that, oh, never thought about it. Why would it bother you? And uh, you know, I'm not like a What is you know, your objection to the, the one, yeah. two, three clap at the end? I don't like it, but I have my own reasons. But I think it's, uh, uh, I have a bigger reason. Um, uh, first of all, I would, you know, like a, Stephen Hitchens, uh, no, Christopher Hitchens has said, if something is, uh, you know, uh, added without the evidence, it can be also, you know, I think the word is discarded, I think, without evidence, yeah? So if you just add, like, okay, now we're going to clap. So I, even without explaining it, uh, why, like, uh, and I have to, like, if you say something and there's no proof and then I have a burden of proof, I think it's, uh, I, I will answer you also, but I, towards those people, I would say, no, no, no. Burden of proof is on you if you introduce certain mm -hmm. thing that you want to add to it and you think it's great value and stuff and then explain me really what it is. Because my argument is that uh, I have I haven't read, uh, like if you read about the clapping method, you know, then usually it's used with kids and it's uh, usually to bring kids back and focus, yeah? They have a certain like and they finish the sentence and they have a focus back. They never send them away with a clap in that sense. Maybe the teacher claps himself to have a like a boom and that's the signal to go. And but usually they bring them back. So that's what I've read, you know, uh, but that how it's taught in schools. And I've talked to also teachers that, that that's the way they use it. And nobody uses it the other way around. Jiu Jitsu mm -hmm. uses it like other way around that they don't bring it back because Usually those adults always, all, after 10 minutes, always a little bit go wander around. So they would need a focus clap after that, uh, but not sending them away because they're, they want to try a new thing. So why do we have a, like a double focus? Because they, they're focused anyway. If you do your job well and don't talk for 15 minutes of when explaining techniques. So, uh, uh, so that's also one of my arguments. That, and also I understand that with sports, people have sometimes, you know, one, two, three. But uh, and then there's also the, the tradition of haka, you know, that people go to war and they do certain like, rituals to make them seem bigger and fire themselves up. And in, in sports, we have one minute breaks and then it's one, two, three, let's go. So certain like a boost of moral, I think. So that's how they use it. But it's different, you know, that uh, it's I think in jiu-jitsu, you cannot say it's boost of moral or something or or it's um, so that's my argument that show me that who uses that show me the methodology 
and show me that I would know more about it. So I'm actually throwing it back to the people that are doing that because show me that I want to read about it. I'm not against it, but I want to understand it more that uh, when do we use it? How do we use it? How much? Uh, so in what situation it's better? Uh, and uh, so I would more turn to the people that are you know, teaching and then I believe them than just somebody that just started, oh, it's so good to clap. And, and also they have the social reasons that, oh, it makes them look like a one unit, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have issues with that because if your class needs that to feel one, then you have other issues. And uh, so there's, I use feedback example as a methodology to speak to people, make to speak, speak to each other. And I think that's way more socializing and when, way more bonding uh, than just everybody, 30 people clapping together. Uh, and I think it's, I'm not, uh, you know, against it, but I want to see like, let's fix everything else. You know, let's make the jujitsu information better. Let's uh, fix the met methodologies. Let's stop the 30 minutes warm ups. And, and then if that's not enough, then let's start clapping. But I think we're, we're fixing the problem from the wrong end that everything is kind of still 30 minutes warm up and now we're clapping and we're actually not fixing the problem that why the problem would be why people quit Jiu Jitsu. And clearly, if the clapping could fix it, we wouldn't have an epidemic of you know <laughs> people leaving leaving stuff and uh, and uh, I think it's a fad, and uh, there's not 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 enough evidence to support what they're doing. And the burden of proof is on them, not on me. That I have to resist that. So that logic also, I think people don't understand that it's their their job to make it v valid, so to speak. That why it's necessary, not my job to find it why it's not. Yeah, I'm, it's not a hill I'm willing to die on, but it just seems to me a progression, right? It's like a yes ladder. First, we're going to call everyone uh, professor or master. Then we're going to all clap when everyone says clap. I mean, anyone who joins a cult, if, 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 if I go down to whatever cult office, they're not going to say, okay, uh, hello, Stefan, nice to meet you. Uh, here's the paper that you sign your possessions over to the church or the cult. Uh, and here's all the things you have to do. You're going to have to cut your hair off. You're going to have to only wear this robe for the rest of your life you're never gonna have sex again you can only eat this food <laughs> that's not on day one it's a gradual progression yeah. okay today we're just gonna come and we're gonna be quiet for two minutes and then we're gonna do this and then tomorrow we're gonna do this and this and this so it, it's just a gradual i see clapping not a bad thing in and of itself maybe it's good maybe it's bad but it's yet another progression towards the teacher says something and you do it and, and, and it's I, easy, yeah. Like and also, I, I think it's easy replacement of you what you really have mm -hmm. to do. It's like bowing to the mat, or you know, people say, "Oh, we have to respect your instructor," and that's the bowing shows. But I think it's a it's it's a fix. It's a ba it's a band aid or to the mm -hmm. wound. You know, if you need bowing to people to respect you, you know, you have issues. Yeah. And uh, if the respect is not there, then it's one way like the dictatorship to demand it because then everybody has to bow and respect you. But but when you don't have those rules, the, you have to actually create environment when you where you are respected because you're doing a good job, you're helping people. And it's like natural that people feel towards you respect in that environment, you know, uh, and that's good. But I find it's like, e it's an easy fix that, oh, now we have a focus. So, no, 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 better learn to teach better, you know? And then people have focus and you don't need it, you know, and then, you use maybe minimal interference with and minimal certain mandatory rules that you have to have that. And uh, then it's maybe like, okay, when you get paired up, you have to uh, clap and knuckle. No, no, no. I can do whatever I want. It's not that, you know, and then you, like, I agree with you. Then you sneak those things in. And finally, it's like um, in 10 years, it's like a hundred rituals you have to do to just, you know, go through the class. And then, you know, with the geese and stuff, it's easy way to make money. And there's actually... I, I'm uh, not scandals, but a lot of teams are push, uh, pushing on certain geese on people yeah. and you have to have it. And then people are like, because they're attached to that, you know, and then they feel obligated. And it's like, a, you know, like a, in a way, game theory that is it makes sense to leave or just take the burden of this and still survive or because the leaving pressure and the negativity that comes from leaving is bigger than accepting the deal, you know, okay, so. 
yeah so the the you have to have a choices and uh, so i i feel like it's a little bit i think we have to push back because certain things are not anymore maybe the the like a what is supporting the jiu-jitsu or it's, it becomes like a i'm not saying a bad way dictatorship but like people can do without anything what they want and then everybody has to accept no 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 people can resist and call coaches out and critique them and but it's it feels like it's 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 like taboo so to speak that and uh, i always said like you know white belts are not white belt people you know they're teachers engineers you know whatever and if they have something to say because they clearly educated uh, and then but many times many super many times people have told me that i just they don't listen to me because i'm a white belt and so it's uh, in a way it's kind of it's uh, so sad that there, there are people that are looked like oh you're a white belt you know nothing or and uh, then still coaches are doing like a, i don't know some weird stretching and half an hour warm up and then teaching three techniques out of their ass so uh well, so i that, totally want to get into yeah. the methodology of organizing okay. a class and the methodology of organizing Got called. Say, a year <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh organizing a year's worth of training say but I, i'm just wondering i mean you're estonian so that's northern european it's the baltic country and until you know the iron curtain fell it was a soviet country so i'm wondering if uh if your reaction and your kind of disdain for hierarchical you know, I'm a purple belt and you're just a white belt, two stripes, and therefore you're my bitch. If that does that come from the the Estonian experience of having been under the oppression of the Soviet Union? So I would I have that reaction towards the bullying or? Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. I, I, I jokingly would like to think that, 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 you know, half of us were sent to Siberia, I guess, in years, you know, decades ago and always always uh we never had our own kind of thing going on and now we're free since 91 and you know second time i guess uh, uh but um i just for me i just don't like stupidity you know i don't i just uh, i it's very hard because i'm very literal person yeah uh if uh, i'm very bad with emotions and in that sense that body language and all those things things has to be said to me like by the way i get like a really mixed messages and i don't understand and it gets awkward and uh, i just don't like the message i get and it's uh, it's for me i would say not logical mm. and why would somebody do this and that and and uh, i just it irritates me because i see how they you know like actor do stuff and it doesn't make sense and then I want to understand it better. And that's why I'm also resisting because it doesn't make sense what they do okay. uh, for that, what they're saying it's for. Okay. And, uh, and then I was like, okay, but why we're doing this? Because clearly it doesn't, uh, doesn't support that reason what you guys have, you know, and there's other better reasons to have to, to change this and do something else that's better because that's why I'm always uh, doubting what I do, what technically, you know, what the defensive stuff and, I'm always doubting myself and looking for better ways and I'm willing to ditch the old ways and it's hard and it's, you know, people then laugh at you, go like, oh, you were wrong and you said this year ago. I was like, yeah, but now we know more. And uh, so I have to do this. And uh, when I see people are stuck in time and they're worshiping something that was old and they're saying that something, somebody did something perfect and it's, it's, that's how it is going to be hundred years now. And then you look any other field and you 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 go like, yeah, but everybody else moves forward in every other wheel. So it happened to Bruce Lee students in, in a way, I guess they got stuck in time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the innovators uh, died and then they just took it and they just kept it, you know, and some people, I guess, went on. Yeah. And some people went on, but there's still debates like, oh, what is the original Jeet Kune Do that Bruce Lee meant? You know, that why does matter? Just move on and uh, fight. And then it's MMA, you know, eventually. So I feel like uh, people get stuck, and uh, I think in jiu-jitsu also, uh, some of it is st it's stuck, you know, how it's done, you know, some years ago. And I think we know better, and it's just logical to do it better and not claim that somebody just invented something perfect. And uh, so, and what's the possibility of that, you know? Uh, and uh, I think for some people, I understand why they're protective of those things. And why they're stuck in there, and uh, but I think that's the hard change, and 
I, in a way, I, I think it changes with generations. And uh, so it's, uh, it's I, hard I to fight makes, because... I, it makes yeah, sense to so. crystallize something if you're trying to preserve it, right? If, if you've got some system of 16th century Japanese jujitsu and you've got the, the 85 katas from that system and you, you see yourself as a custodian of history... Of course, that stuff has changed since the 1600s, but you're trying to change it as little as possible, right? I mean, it's like if you're a, a custodian of, of if you if you collect old maps for a museum, yeah. you're not going to the museum and changing the map, going, oh look, these idiots didn't realize that Antarctica was an island, you know, they they didn't realize that North America is connected to South America. You don't go in there with a magic marker and change it, but that your job is being a historian, trying to preserve something from the past. So people can see it. Something like jujitsu is an evolving living thing because the way that people fight changes, the way that the knowledge that's out there changes, even untrained people in the street are doing different things now than they did 50 years ago. I mean, I've seen homeless people do moves from jujitsu when they're fighting on each other. How did they learn yeah. it? Maybe they saw two other guys fighting and those guys watched a UFC at a bar like so I, I think there's a role for preservation. I, I'm glad that the original Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is kind of enshrined. And if you want to go look at a book, you can go look at a book and maybe watch videos of Helio doing the, you know, the figure four ankle lock. But in the interim, I mean, if, if you want to win Abu Dhabi, I'm going to suggest that you should probably focus on the heel hook rather than the figure four ankle lock. So uh, and, and totally those people that uh, that do that to preserve and I think uh, they they get a little bit stuck in time because they have an agenda and that agenda is not to change with time but to keep it and then they get really conflicted if the time moves on long enough you know and then then it they instead of become obsolete uh, or you know like they they instead of losing so to speak they start to maybe build more legends and reasons and why this would be and and uh, instead of just admitting oh times are changing and now let's do it differently and and some uh, because it's i think it's very very awesome to admit that somebody took something that far changed something you know and then okay let's let's us take it further because helio was also innovator so so uh, clearly it's not even debate about it it's clearly innovator but but why again we a little bit stuck in time after his and uh, it's like he created something perfect that I, I think that claim is um, people don't like that claim that it was inefficient and we could do better. And and then he didn't study it all. And and I, I think a little bit people take it too challenging, like, oh, you're challenging my ways. No, 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 no. It's just you have to know what was the probability that he discovered something, the whole system as a perfect system. He was clearly you know, you could say it's, you know, leg locks and stuff and here and there. So look how much Jiu-Jitsu has evolved and when it, uh, you know, went open to public, so to speak. We have discovered so many ways to do things better. So, so you know, that's also what, you know, we're talking today is also teaching that how it was done in old ways and now we know more. So when we're talking about teaching either a class or a sequence of classes, your, your logic and science and research and data-driven guy that's pretty obvious where are you getting your reference points like what are you looking at do you have a background in education are you reading that literature no. are you looking at studies of learning so i guess i i uh, that i'm self-taught because i only have a, i think not a degree but i have a I, i've studied five years the telecommunication and how to actually how to you know send signals to the you know other side of the earth so to speak so kind of funny actually uh, in that sense uh, but uh, I've read some books that talk about it uh, I guess I've uh, met good coaches that are educated uh, in that sense and uh, so they kind of maybe said yeah I see what they did and also we talked about I've talked to teachers how they do things and I think I'm not uh, I'm not going to claim any superiority and stuff and uh, everything I do is uh, right, so to speak. But I think it's it is based on those things, how sports are taught. And I think uh, even with my, you know, let's say limited amount of things that I've read, let's let's say it like that. 
it's not hard to actually make a good uh, class that's mm -hmm. uh, based on you know uh, acquiring sports skills and uh, all the all the you know that talks about the play and how to do the you know even the warm up and how to pass skills on to people and the inquiry methods and so and uh, i'm also i guess lucky one that uh, uh, right now I've, you know i've read more but it all started we, i was a part of spg you know i think you know there's matt thornton and stuff and uh, so matt was really you know he wrote the liveness blog and there was a lot about like drilling and uh, early on how to how to do stuff, how to teach and how how to run a class. So I started with those things and then then I read. And uh, so that's that's about it. And uh, I think I, that's already like a good base to give a good class in that sense. And then and I don't know how to classify myself, what coach I am, because clearly, you know, there's a kids coaches. There is a, you know, kind of mid-level, there is a, you know, Olympic coaches that they really fine-tune people and go with specifics. So I think I'm more kind of overall, I can give a overall good class. I've taught kids in acrobatics also in school uh, without knowing myself uh, too much. I was a stage fighter. We did acrobatics and fenced and uh, rapiers in a, in, a, in a restaurants and stuff. So I, I've done some uh, like a th theatrical acrobatics that uh, they use methods to teach ordinary people. So, and I also teach taught kids in school and I did pretty good. Even the, the friend I have is a physical education teacher that saw my classes was like, oh, you only need a paper, dude. It's, it's like, uh, it's, so I've always been interested of the uh, learning. And uh, yeah, so it's, I give you like a little vague answer because it's just uh, accumulation of information and books by time. And then always being doubt and talking to smart people like the Iceland talk, uh, there was one teacher, like a, I think it was a geography teacher in a class. And after the, that talk in Iceland, we spent, I think, uh, you know, enough amount of time to talking about it. And he was like saying that, oh, yeah, it makes sense. And this is how you do it. And so I'm always looking for confirmation a little bit about uh, how people have done it and from teachers. And so I can go on. I'm sure I'm doing the right thing. And now I move on. Okay. So so that's how I've grown to have an opinion and also, I guess the results that uh, uh, that if I teach a class, and then I see that people are using the stuff in sparring or not, so you can have a correlation of that was the class good or did you accomplish what you came to do, and is it like one person pulled off something new that they did in class or most of them pulled off and majority most of them, so to speak, like eighty percent pulled off the stuff you did in a class, so. So that's also good, uh, good uh, kind of like a measuring stick. So you so that's kind of about my background. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. You've been a big critic of the whole show up, warm up for 20, 30 minutes, show two or three techniques, and then spar kind of like as three separate yes. and disconnected parts of a class. And I'm guessing that something like, I don't know, 50 to 60 or 70% of classes are taught that way. Why why don't you like that? I mean, obviously it has worked for some people, right? Some people who came up through that system have done really well, become world champions even. Uh, is it because of that or maybe even in spite of that that they've become I better? think it's uh, it, I think it's latter. So uh, so it's still I think it's hard to prove because you know I if you want to really do the science, you do this and that, but I think we can make some assumptions. And uh, people would agree, and you can people can criticize them, but but uh, uh, let's say I think I don't think even warm ups are necessary in that sense in a regular class, because in that traditional way that uh, at least my classes are progressively getting harder. So there is uh, maybe eight minutes you move around a bit. Sometimes we drill, sometimes we slow roll, and if the class is not high speed right away. Uh, you know, you don't you you don't need that. I always said that we do warm ups. Basically, um, in my classes, in main classes, only reason is eight to ten minutes is that I consider those two classes a week that I teach blue belts and up would be there two times a week when they do physical exercise. So at least we lubricate all the joint twice a week, you know, and move around and do the crab walks and all the stretching and lunges and hip mobility stuff. 
and it all takes uh, eight to ten minutes. And sometimes we, you know, mix it up by slow rolling and you know some specific drills. But that's the only reason for me to do it. And I'm not stuck in that that we have to because clearly, if you have seen warm ups that take twenty or thirty minutes and people shrimping all over the place, uh, when you look at that their technique, it's uh, sloppy, you know. And, so are, uh, are you anti that warm up? traditional warm up because it's a waste of time or because yes. it brings you to the technical portion of the class in a tired state so that you'll absorb less both both it depends also you know you know i guess what they do but uh, I, I guess the point is you come to the class and you pay for jiu jitsu yeah you want to get better learn something new roll that's the fun part and uh, again i would say if somebody wants to justify 30 minutes warm up the burden of proof is on them you know that uh, that I can explain that why it's waste of time because I, I know that oh but shrimping is a very fundamental but but you know after a while you don't concentrate anymore that the shrimp doesn't serve its purpose I think if you do a couple of classes then they're learning the move but later maybe it makes sense to do it with partner or something it doesn't serve the purpose anymore because it becomes sloppy and uh, you've there's crossed better the river way but now you're carrying the boat with you still. Yeah, and uh, so you can have an argument what it's what it's for, and the argument sometimes is that oh, I'm teaching jujitsu in that part, but maybe you shouldn't, you know. Uh, and uh, but I could also understand that maybe you have twenty different warm ups when some warm ups you do technical stand up, some warm ups is shrimping, some warm ups is rolling, you know, you you mix it up. So every twenty warm ups are different, so to speak. They're diff teaching you different skills. I could understand that. Uh, but still, I would say 20 minutes, 30 minutes is is uh, much because all the learning happens when you play with other people and with resistance and stuff. So even uh, let's say if the class could be longer, two hours, and if somebody, if most people could actually take two hour classes, maybe 30 minutes would be ideal. But when we see that, you know, it's not random that there's a memes about it, that purple balls are missing warm ups, you know, it's a. It's the, the it's only funny because it's true because it's annoying, yeah. And we have to know that it's annoying. That I think when when higher higher belts that should be the biggest fans are avoiding actively warm ups, I think they're also right. Uh, I think it's truth in that that uh, why would you do it? They're already so well equipped. Maybe just rolling around, have a slow roll, would make more sense than just teaching purple balls how to shrimp. Mm -hmm. Because their motivation is different compared to the beginners, you know, the white belts and stuff. So I don't think we have to force purple belts. And uh, there's definitely, uh, I've struggled with those things also. And uh, and it's not like, oh, we have to yield and, you know, not do warm-ups. But I think there's tr some truth why people socially, uh, like, again and again, they feel they have to avoid warm-up because it is boring. And when I look at me, when I start rolling, I don't do warm-up. Uh, I literally, it's like, uh, I'm not even ashamed to uh, do, like admit that, but I just, I do my defensive stuff in a couple of first five minutes because I'm, you know, I'm trying to shield myself and get warm. And if somebody's nice, I open up. If somebody's more aggressive, I close down and wait for myself a little bit to get warmed up and get my breathing. And then I join the role and, and sometimes it's a mutual agreement. Let's do a lighter one, five minutes, and then let's ask each other, let's pick it up and then we go. So and I don't think it's nothing bad. And then if I want to have mobility stuff, maybe I do it a separate day or something. Or So I'm already aware what's going on. You know, I, I'm always saying after a purple belt, I like to be more as a guide uh, because you're no, you know, you kind of know at that level what you're playing with. And, you know, and it's, it's not going to be I'm going to be your dad. I'm just going to make you do stuff. And I think if you go to competition, then you have to do a strong warm up before a fight because you get like <gasps> adrenaline, adrenaline, adrenaline dump and everything. So there's a reason to do it there, and most people are motivated to before competition to do it. But before every class, I think there's not so much reasons when they already know how to shrimp and spin, and they could have way more fun. Maybe even like a specific is if it's a half card passing class for them. Maybe do a specific sp like a light roll when average is more half guard situations, you know, mm -hmm. and that gets them more 
uh, also like a tuned in for a class because they meet their problems. They have questions. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember I had that problem, you know. So you fine tune them better. And it's actually part of the very important part of the class in that sense, warm uping like that. And they don't feel it's like waste of time of 10 minutes that they don't learn jujitsu. So I think it's like overemphasized uh, that the class has to have it like a specific whatever. So the, that's the, my issue with it. The argument that I've seen for hard warm ups, like we're talking like half hour, you know, where you're doing hundreds and hundreds of push ups, hundreds and hundreds of squats, hundreds and hundreds of ab exercises in ongoing circuits is that, well, I, I want my guys to be in shape when they compete. I hate right? those people. Uh, I've always thought that you should do that stuff on your own, but I could see from an instructor's point of view, like these guys aren't going to, aren't going to do that conditioning on their own. I want my school to be a strong school. I want all my guys to be in shape. Therefore I'm going to uh, insist on this hard warm up. I, I, uh, also, I think I, in a way I agree and disagree, but it also it depends if you want that school, if you want, uh, let's say if you want only tough people to join your gym, then hard rolling first day, uh, all submissions allowed first day. And let's uh, weed only the talented one and toughest one out. And you have a really nice gym. And if that was your goal, a late goal, a happy birthday, and you achieved that. And uh, I'm not against that if that's publicly your goal. But then say it out also publicly that everybody that joins your schools knows what's going on and it's trials, you know. But if you want, uh, so I think overall class could be, a, you know, like a, I don't know, family friendly class or something. And if you, I'm not a physical education coach. And you know, I, I, I guess when I want advice, I have people to turn to. But I'm smart enough to know that uh, I cannot do 100 push-ups and squats and abs in a class because it may look a good like a one class, let's shock people and let's do some just a idiotic thing. But then how do you measure progress? Then next class, we would have to do 101 or 110. And who, who's, measuring, who's measuring the pause, how much we break in the between? And uh, so we have a progressive way of getting better, not like full year, we're only doing 100 push-ups uh, but there has to be a way to progress, you know. So I understand also that, oh, we if you do just overall this kind of thing, you develop certain conditioning. But also you would develop that uh, during the roles. And uh, is it important for an everyday person that joins the class? And uh, so, so I'm not saying it's totally wrong. It just depends if you think it's uh, it makes it's a conditioning class and everything else, then please tell me how you measure your heart rate because uh, you know if you want to have a if you want to become better runner you will measure a heart rate you will run in a specific uh, yeah. like a you know range of heart you write it all down yeah and you have a watch and you have a specific range when your heart should be and then you you know just run faster and keep the same heart rate yeah because you measure it so if your argument not yours but if people argument is oh we will get more conditioned then wouldn't you want it to be more measured and more specific and you just randomly shoot the gun and you know some people get better some people don't so it's a really really irresponsible thing to do uh, and also to claim that you know anything about physical education and how to make people better because there's a famous saying that any stupid can make people tired you know it makes uh, it takes a coach or somebody you know educated to make actually somebody better so I'm, I really dislike the thought that I've actually been in a class uh, when people, we rolled and then they circled up. It it's seems like a joke, but it really happened. Uh, they circled up and uh, there was like 10, up to 15 people in a circle. And then everybody had to do like an ab exercise that was different from the other person did it, who did it. And maybe it was, I don't know, 20 or something reps and everybody did a different. So it's, a, it's it's 200 abs or something, you know, in the end of the class. And and there wasn't like anything else later. It just was a, like maybe 200 or even more ab exercises. So so why would you do that? It's like it doesn't make any sense. And I'm a, I'm a surprised sometimes how people think they that. But I don't think they did it because they're mean, you know, that mm -hmm. I think they did it from the goodness of their heart. So I'm sometimes I'm surprised that they don't have their you know self-critic in place that 
they would admit I have no clue about how to actually, you know, actually build muscle or condition people or what it takes on programming and everything. And just let's not do it. You know, just let's cool down, maybe walk around, let's talk or, you know. And so that's a very really strange thing that a lot of people I feel do not do not admit that that there's maybe they think it's too easy. Oh, it's conditioning. It's easy. Yeah, right. There's a programming and there's a like a I don't know eight different like a level of strength. You know, like lactic tolerance, endurance, explosiveness, main strength. So it's a uh, it's like it's not like just conditioning. You know, so so I feel like a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And uh, that is a very dangerous thing. And then maybe they also refuse to read books. And that's even more dangerous. Yeah. So if, we, if we've done a quick warm up just to get the joints lubricated, get the heart rate up, get a bit of a sweat on, essentially reduce our chance of injury. Yes. And now we move on to, to teach something. Let's say you're teaching the arm bar to a bunch of beginners, right? A predominantly a beginner group. I mean, we all know what that would look like in a traditional class. Okay, first you do this, then you do that, then you do this, then you do that. Maybe the second technique is if he links his hands together, then you do this. Third technique, if the arm bar doesn't work, here's how you switch to a triangle. That's probably too much for beginners, but whatever. Yes. What's wrong with that approach? And how would you structure your class on the arm bar differently? Uh, so... Uh, I guess if you say just a straight R bar, then I would start from the end. I would uh, just, uh, I would probably show the arm bar what it is, you know, and then the submission. So they understand the threat that when it's broken and when it, you know, when it stops. So, and then I do it from the end and, uh, I would let probably them wiggle in the arm bar, you know, to try and, you know, try to, so other person holds and, uh, let's say, in a way that uh, slowly, because, you know, the pain, it's not like right away. It's like you feel it and then it's, you know, you scream in that sense. But I would start from the end and I would let somebody just, you know, teach them out uh, safety and wiggle a little bit. Other person controls. And then I would maybe have a call out that if I say finish, then you can a little bit extend and they have to tap and they go back to holding and they wait for another command finish. So they go again, but and at the same time, they're developing that control. And if the command comes in, you know, randomly by finish, they can a little bit extend, you know, and then other person already like feels, you don't have to go for a, like a super kind of breaking point, but you feel like, oh, it's getting worse. And then it rela relaxed a little bit. So beginners learn to control first, and then they can, you know, have the finishing mechanics. So, but teaching, I would definitely do it in that, so in that sense, that's an easy class that, from the finish and then even I think I would give them uh, ability if you connect I would say show me how you think you could break it and we you know without hurting anybody that kicking somebody in the head or something you know <laughs> that somebody would lock and then they would try because I would show it they would try it okay the, I would use introduction stage if I go back a little bit I just uh, you know show the introduction stage to understand the mechanics of the you know breaking and then if you get it then let's go you know, they lock some other way. Uh, even I don't, I don't maybe mention how they could lock, just lock as a beginner, whatever they think about, you know, that maybe just leave even that dead detail out. They can lock their arms. And then show me what you think, how you could open those arms. And uh, I don't want them to have a perfect answer, but I just want them to try. Because now they're building a context of realizing how hard it actually is and what works and what doesn't work. So sometimes they... They even do something that I want to show them. So if I show them that later, they feel good because they, they got it themselves. And that's reaffirms that they can figure stuff out on their own and they're not given the answer. And then also because they, maybe they did it. I say, try find three or five ways to break it. Maybe they found one, but now they have a question. How do we break it more? And so there's a learning right away that I want that to answer. And then if I give them that, it sticks to them better because they created a problem before. So and, and then maybe we do a drill again that you can hold and then you can finish. But now it's from here until the end you go. But first you learn it from here to finish. Then you learn it from here to finish. And if we have time, maybe I do it from mount, but I don't think it's necessary. Maybe I just do it from the S mount, you know. 
-hmm. S mount and hold, hold, you know, and then you go. So I would go from the end to the more to the, you know, beginning that way. And then after our class, uh, let's say 10 minutes was a warm up still for beginners, you know, they need that because it's, they have to know what jiu-jitsu looks like and how the body moves. Mm -hmm. So 20 minutes of introduction stage, even less maybe, if it's uh, that simple information. And then 30 minutes to 35 minutes drilling with resistance, switching partners, adding feedback uh, between rounds, maybe talking what was good, what could have been better. So there's an icebreaker. Uh, people uh, praise each other and they're also telling them what could be better. Uh, so and uh, that's also good that, you know, you that uh, I use this simple rule of the self-determination theory of, you know, uh, it's a, you know, very kind of, I, I don't know, famous or whatever, uh, famous psychological theory of why, why do you stick around to things is the social aspect, the competence, and uh, what's the other one, third one? Uh, social competence and, uh, God damn it, uh, autonomy. And I think there's a fourth one, uh, you can, people can look it up, but uh, Bain did, but let's talk about those three. So if you autonomy is independent, that you know that you do your own decisions, that you learn to open up the arms yourself, and then maybe you, somebody's given you answer, uh, but you have your own decision making process there. Uh, then the competence is you feel you're good because you can open those arms even if they resist, you know. Uh, so and if they even resist harder, you can go harder. So you feel you're actually doing it, not you're given the things. So in reality is there. And also social aspect is that you talk to each other, you know, that somebody, so you criticize constructively some, somebody uh, and uh, there's, you know, you're becoming more friends with people and uh, you can tell them what was good, you can do this better. And also by explaining somebody what they did good and what they could do better, you learn, you're actually teaching somebody. And by explaining somebody what they have to do, you're memorizing yourself better. Because the visual, I think the, you know, cortex, whatever, it's working when you explain stuff. And so, and then it's usually funny, you know, if you would do the same mistakes that you just talked about. So people tend to do, you know, less of those mistakes in, in some way and, you know, progressively less. If they talk about it, then they teach others. And uh, so they can actually, in that sense, learn when they're a partner and when they're doing their stuff. Other way, you know, being partner, sometimes it's like, it's boring, you know, you just have to be a dummy. But you have to be maybe aware what they're doing, explaining, seeing what they do, and then you can tell them. So you're always in a process of watching what they do. So you're actually also learning because one, one thing is watching others and one thing is doing it yourself. And also recognizing what they do good. And so it's it's a, like a you know, a little bit self-reflecting. I, uh, like, so, I yeah, like the so. approach of getting students to try and figure it out on their own, or at least come up with some of the answers, or at least come up with their own questions, right? Like I, because there's that saying that, you know, people remember whatever, 10% of what they see, 30% uh, of what they hear, 50% uh, of what they do. But yes. if they discover it themselves, or they, if they discover the answer themselves, they're going to remember that forever. And so if they, I find it's, I find that sometimes I get a backlash of, uh, because it's, it is, it looks like a waste of time. And for people who don't know the method of, you know, grading a context and having a question, like it's easier to ask for answer. And then it's very, it's harder to just, if I tell you, go figure it out. And so I know some people feel like, oh shit, I was hoping to answer, you know, that now I have to do the work myself. Um, but, but that's for the longevity, you know, that's why uh, you have to, you know, by building this habit of finding out yourself, this is what you need when we are in purples and brown belts, you know, that mm -hmm. you need to solve ability to believe even that you can solve your own problems. And it starts with giving small tasks to white belt and, you know, giving them most of the answers, but also letting them a little bit suffer. Not like, you know, they have to yeah. figure out jujitsu on their own, like totally, but uh, always like, what do you think? And then, okay, well, I think this and that, and oh, actually, you know, this is almost right, and do this, oh, yeah. So, but if you always do this, uh, the you know, sometimes the feedback is it's, you're wasting, even like the pressures, one hour class would be even like five minutes. If you go, let's try to figure out how to break the, you know, how to break this. And if both of people try, 
it's it's even a little bit more than five minutes that time is wasted that you could show it new technique or you could you know do something and then then i show you so there's arguments that why don't you just give them the answer it's easier it's quicker but then for longevity you will bite yourself in ass so to speak that you will have people around that everything is given and then uh, by but encouraging people to solve problems themselves and then like you said longevity is like uh, if they understand why they did it you know they they do it themselves uh, it sticks with them longer and then you don't have those things that oh what was the sweep yesterday we did you know mm-hmm. or something that that uh, so that's not a question that I don't like that, that 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 sweeps you know every 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 class is a new sweep or two new sweeps and then after a week you go what was the sweep we did two weeks ago so that's the problem with that methodology that if you're just giving people situational answers and then it's like then you're accumulating techniques and that nobody's pulling off those things in a mat and you're kind of wasting your time as a coach I'm guessing you're not a fan of there, there are several very large jiu-jitsu organizations that don't allow sparring for the first one to two to three months that mm-hmm. you that you sign up. You're brand new. You walk in the door. You get you buy your three hundred dollar gi that they buy for thirty dollars in China, uh, and then they you're not allowed to spar until you reach whatever the the magic criteria is. And there's probably in the, in most of those, I, I, I don't want to speak 100%, but even that sort of live situational drilling isn't emphasized. It's really, you know, you, you don't get to do anything until you learn the 35 magic techniques or the 45 magic techniques. So I'm, I'm guessing you're not, a, I'm laughing because the answer is obvious. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing you're not a fan of that methodology. But, but uh, the reason uh, they do it is they think it increases student retention. Maybe it doesn't yes. make for a better student in the long run, but the reason they argue is that you're going to have more people stick with it if they don't get discouraged by sparring initially. So I actually understand the I understand the logic and the the reason people have. Uh, let's say you know, like I like to say it bluntly, I think they're wrong, uh, and it's easy to uh, yeah, but it's easy to because I don't spar, I don't let people spar in the first three months. Okay. And uh, I agree with that. But then progressive drilling, mm. because it is, you know, I I know clubs that uh, allow people, th- let's say, to jump in, you know, like randomly to a class. So it wasn't even a beginner's course. It was just one class, you know, and beginners come in and then they run, then they roll in first class. And the argument was that, but that's the way you learn during rolls. And that's stupid. Yeah. First of all, you don't, as a beginner, you don't learn anything during the roll. You just... You have no clue what's going on and you put yourself on unnecessary risk because you don't know, you know, those submissions and you don't know when to tap or turn out. And you have a flight or fight moments that actually are more dangerous, you know, other people also because, you know, I can I've been hit with elbows and stuff with beginners. So I think the argument is very bad. And if people would be honest, they wouldn't say that. Uh, and by, uh, for me, I think it's taught argument because it's taught by coaches to, to think that, like that because they want to justify their method. Uh, but it has to be also like uh, resisted because it's stupid. Uh, and uh, so what, how I would say it is you would have to introduce – the people have to understand that it's not like you know fighting for life because usually you know fighting like boxing and stuff – Something kicks in in people that, you know, that they want to survive and it's something else than just playing sports, you know, like a basketball. A little bit is different. And uh, we have to gradually, you know, teach them to how to handle themselves in that situation. So I find that uh, it also has worked so far. I find that uh, doing drills, you know, progressive resistance drills, when one learns to be a partner, uh, if you're good at finishing arm bars, I can hold on, you know, more. I can make it harder for you. And I learned to be a better partner. I learned to tap. That's okay. I'm a partner. But if you make it a first day as a fight, that you you if you win armbar, you actually win, you know? And if I lose the armbar, I actually lose. Imagine how many armbar arms will be broken in a first day because people take it too serious because they don't want to lose. Oh, I've, I've so seen if, it. Yeah. So if you take it out of the equation and make it like a bad and good, you know, like a, one is a you know bad guy, not bad guy, but one is a training partner. 
but then you get progressively harder and then you help each other. So you get to the mood that they learn to handle themselves in that stress. And you, I would say you, you, you make it look differently. It's not anymore like a, you know, you're losing your face when you tap, you know. And uh, you teach those little chunks of jiu-jitsu separately in three months, you know, in different darses, guillotines. We do actually Achilles and knee bar and, you know, passes and stuff. But we try to do a little bit of resistance so they learn to handle themselves with aggressivity, aggressivity, yeah? And that gives us the better, like, a, not perfect, but better, uh, like a jump board to, to the sparring because they have done in three months those separate stuff that's a familiar for them in sparring. Uh, but they are, I guess the glue is missing that, you know, from arm bars to the leg lock, there's, you know, guard passing and stuff that's really hard to teach in three months. But they, some places are familiar. So they're, they're used to the stress and they're not so unfamiliar to sparring because they've done it in a small amount, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 I'm not saying it's like, you know, like a, uh, I would say, I wanted to say like a vaccine or something these days to just irritate people. But, uh, but little bit amounts of time that we learn to trust them that they can handle the weapon, you know. And then after we have three months and then they learn to, they come to base course. We have base course, main group and, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, beginner, main, uh, sorry, beginner, base, main and advanced. So they come to base course and then they learn to, sp then they start to spar. Uh, and uh, but, so, but the whole it, time on from day one, they're doing something against progressive yeah, resistance. Yeah, they're getting their sweat going because that's what they want. They have on sweat, and also I understand what why they're doing it. This uh, other people that let's say they don't allow people to isolate even anything. I understand that. Oh, if they get hurt, that they don't come to back. I that's why we don't allow sparring because it's obvious if you let beginners day one, you know, spar, you know, something breaks. But th there's a method to introduce that very safe safely because let's say you have an armbar and progressive resistance means that I make it harder for them. So if they're not ready, I can make it harder by one centimeter, you know, in that sense, you know, then two. So I can make it harder for them so they can get used to it. And if they can pull it off in that resistance, let's make it harder. Let's make it harder. And most people. Uh, they feel they want to go harder because they're not afraid anymore, you know. And uh, even arm bars, they they want to be. Uh, if you do arm bar, they want to progress better because now they they feel that you're not going to break their arm that they can train with you, and they can go harder because they know that uh, the opening they you're not going to hurt them, so they're willing to actually go that extra step. So I would say there there is a method, and I understand those people that say that that it's dangerous. But there is a method to do it in a way that people, other way, if you just keep them three months away, you will have an extra weird jump from be a beginner's course to the sparring. And then they all go all nuts. And you will have actually worse, like a transition because they get, they get smashed right away if they go to sparring. And you still have people who get hurt because they're not used to resistance at all. Mm -hmm. And I think you cushion them for so long that you actually make things worse. Because for three months they think they know something, and they they're good, you know they they know they think they know something, and then the sparring hits, and they actually everything falls apart. So I think it's even even uh, not it's super dangerous actually to cushion people from reality like this. And uh, so uh, if I would say also like always emphasizing that if people would be honest, you know what they want to do that they would see it's actually more dangerous. But if it doesn't happen today, it's easy to go, oh, whatever happens three months, I don't care, but today you're safe. No, no, no. let's start to introduce them to danger day one mm -hmm. in a small amount. And then in the long run, we we get there. But it, And uh, I think it's a bad argument from people that, no, no, they're not ready. No, 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 no. You have to know the method and it's enough to give them a little bit tiny of reality. That they can handle yeah there's not maybe not locks or whatever you can try whatever you want to do so so um, i think those people need to need to know that uh, there has to be a better method because their method is not uh, uh serving their purpose and actually creating something worse in the end yeah uh, and, it's a lesson yeah. that's been learned so many times by especially like traditional martial artists who would spend months or literally years training their techniques 
And then they put on the sparring gloves for the first time. And it's chaos. Like it's, it reverts to two guys throwing right hand haymakers at each other so quickly. They forget about the hands being up. They, they forget about any sense of throwing combinations. It, it just goes from, they, they might look fantastic on the punching bag. They might look fantastic shadow boxing. They might look fantastic on the focus mitts. But if there hasn't been any any challenge along the way, then just suddenly jumping into sparring and having this be like a separate reality that you visit, it becomes survival of the fittest, survival of the strongest, survival of the toughest instantly. It's, it's actually, it's awful for people, but it's pretty funny to watch that transition. Uh, yeah, and, and also I think I remember something that I will mention. There's a... I think my my you know I always say like uh, my old, almost good friend uh, Chris Paynes, uh, he has a podcast Villain Cast and I think somebody quoted what something they said he, they said more dirty drills less perfect techniques and uh, this was also what I wanted to say that uh, we cannot misguide people what it what it is what they're dealing with and if you just do uh, like a really perfect techniques you know and three months and everything is so shiny and you know but and then the sparring hits they will hate the sparring because it doesn't look the way they learned mm -hmm. and uh, but we want to introduce them their reality as you know like a randomness and pulling and messiness there's still technique but it's it looks real and they get used to it you know the aggression and the randomness of it you know it's not every everything is not like one two three and i think that um I understand the, um, like, um, what is it? Uh, uh, I understand the visuals of wanting to have a perfect technique. You know, like, uh, it's like, <laughs> like everything is, but when you add resistance, it's not. So, so why, why fool people to, to make them think that martial arts is something pretty mm -hmm. visually? Uh, I would say, uh, and I, I know you understand me right, that it's still visually pretty when it's under resistance. But then it's differently visually pretty because you understand it's a resisting and then the technique happens and that's why also it's pretty, so to speak. But it's not like visually like, like a robotic pretty. A messy technique sometimes is very pretty because it was done against people that resist 100% and there's certain beauty in that. But it's not only like always the visual kind of beauty, but it's like something else. So that's why also I think it's really dangerous to keep people away from the reality a bit. Um, and, uh, uh, so, you know, I'm not a parent yet, so to speak, always I have to tell that, but as much as I've talked to parent and I will be one soon also is, uh, Congratulations. uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, it's like, you know, if you cushion them from the world, you're doing them disservice in that sense, I guess every parent has said that just let them be and just a little bit, you know, hold them and, uh, but they have to figure stuff out on their own and you have to be a guide. And if you cushion them from the life, so to speak, how unpretty the life is and sometimes unfair, then you will have a, like an individual maybe in a 18 years past. It's like, you know, not really connected to the world. So I feel in Jiu-Jitsu also we want to protect and cushion and, you know, that we think they can't handle it. And uh, sometimes oh, also what I want to say that uh, sometimes I have uh, I, I wish I would use that more in the classes and I forget sometimes. Uh, that I would maybe want to teach something. And then I ask people that, okay, but try it, show me what you know about that yourself and how would you solve this? And you would be amazed how many often people just do like, poof, and you go like, oh, I was just to, I was little bit about to show this, you know, that they, they sometimes they don't need to be taught or even let's say I have isolation drills for a back take from turtle. Let's say a simple thing. Sure. And then I tell people, like, show me your back takes, what you think. And uh, I see if I want to, you know, fix something or add something, whatever. And then I sometimes also like, oh, like, oh, but I have nothing to add here, actually, that you're doing a pretty good job and let's just kick in resistance and let's figure out things under resistance and then I will guide you more. That I find that, oh, I didn't have to actually teach anything, but because they knew, because I gave them opportunity and then it made my life easier and I can be a guide. And I, w I, w I wish, uh, I hope that also coaches more would use it because I know myself I could use it to just trust people that they can figure stuff out 
and give them that opportunity. Not everything needs to be taught. And you would be amazed sometimes what people what people show and you go like, I never expected you would do this actually. And uh, so to take a learning away from you as a star, as a coach, but make them put it back and they should figure it out. And you would just go, you know, okay, switch, switch. Yeah. So uh, I, and suppose I can a do little a, bit of yeah. a danger there that students reach, get a false positive signal, right? Like yeah. supposing you got a, if I, if I go in there at 210 pounds and I go, and just by chance, everyone in my class is a hundred and is a hundred pounds less than me. I might figure out that just doing a bicep curl is a good defense against an arm bar. Or or the other, you know, classic false positive is the the triangle choke from clothes guard where you pull one arm, push the other, and jump your legs up, mm -hmm. which works pretty good against white belts, kind of against blue belts, and higher than that, the guy has to be pretty tired or make a pretty serious mistake. Mm. For for that, so there's there's this the chance that people hit upon a false a false positive or like a a local maxima something that'll work at their level that won't work at higher levels, but I don't think that's a reason to not have that training method because you can always say, hey, look, just so you know, Stefan, that bicep curl is going to work great against all these women and children that you're sparring with. It's not going to work. When you get in, you know, when you go against someone your own size, so that's easy enough to adjust for. Yeah, and yeah, I guess if you have that that much difference, then you can make a you know make a rule up that you have to find three different escapes to go, yeah. and one can be this. So why not do it? Because it's fun for if somebody is definitely hundred pounds lighter, <laughs> they get sit up and it's kind of everybody <laughs> laughs. So, but then I would I would definitely do it because it's good for a smaller person, you know. Because finally, I think the bicep also gets tired. But then I would say like, okay, you're bigger, but then try to have like three, three mm -hmm. altogether escapes. Yeah. And then if you do this, I don't mind if you do the bicep also. So it's just for fun and giggle, you know? So I wouldn't, uh, because I find sometimes if, uh, if people, I've done it on uh, I've uh, maybe, and also I know that very famous example I always use, somebody has done it, that uh, coaches have those absolute that don't do it because that usually it's it's if you say somebody don't do it they will still do it anyway <laughs> if you're not watching so but the technique has to be weeded out because i actually don't mind when somebody does this uh, because uh, still it's a technique that can work under certain circumstances mm -hmm. and uh, maybe it just has to be weeded out and it's very very awesome when it's weeded out by somebody that's maybe they meet their own size and then they understand so my thing is just to, as a guide, that, okay, you do it, but know that when you meet your own per, own kind, then you would have a harder time. So, but I ask you to do a, like a two more mistakes and, the, you know, escapes, and then you can do this. So I let it, I don't shoot it down, so to speak, that, oh, they're wrong, don't do it. You know, if somebody's, I guess, listening to that, then they don't recognize Preet, because usually I say just, no, don't. Uh, you know, it's a kind of joke, but, uh, but uh I would I would let it out like a, I would try to encourage them and guide them instead of just say don't do it because we had a guy in a gym that did triangles from everywhere he had a really de weird dexterity from the hips and stuff and somebody told him that uh, don't do it anymore because it would hinder your development and at the time I thought he was right but now I think he was not so much because that guy maybe could have been the best ever in triangles everywhere, you know? So who are you to know the future that this, you have to be average in everything or, or excellent in something, you know? So, um, so now these days I would, I would say to people, person who does that, that, you know, you, do you know what's going to happen with your game if you just continue doing that? Do you accept the responsibility of mm. being that guy? There you and go, then, treating people like adults again. <laughs> yeah. And which, which uh, then, you know, you because if, if I've had, I, if I've had a guy in a gym that does triangles everywhere, I think it's awesome. You know, everybody gets, you know, immune against uh, triangles from everywhere. And then I would tell him also that if you want to change your mind in any time in the future, you can do that. So don't feel pressured that you're that guy. And now you can't change because you're embarrassed to change. I would say, no, no, no. Do how, what, how long you want to do it. And if you find something, Something else to do, change it, and you're off. You know, but it's gonna laugh at you that oh, now you changed. So I make them responsible. You know that I give them the accountability. 
And now it's other way. I have to just yell at him every time I see him. And it's kind of stressful to be a coach like this. So, so that's now I do it this way. And uh, I, I think it's more healthy. And uh, people can be artists and, you know, they can do their stuff. And who am I to know what, what the future brings? And so I don't like to be an Ostradamus. So, so yeah, sorry. Oh, no, it's, it's a really good point that you make. Let's just finish up with the idea of programming a curriculum over a longer period of time. Let's assume that we've got beginners who have a basic sense of what an armbar is, basic sense of what a triangle choke is, basic sense of the positions, a couple of escapes. So from each position, so high white belt, low blue belt, that kind of level. But now they're in a general class where there's some advanced people, you know, there's blue belts, purple belts, brown belts, couple black belts. How do you structure the class of what you're going to cover and over the course of a year? I mean, we, we already know you're not a big fan of the instructor just teaching whatever three techniques he dreamed up that day or went and watched <laughs> on YouTube and then didn't tell anybody that he was got them off of YouTube. Uh, so you're, you're not a fan a, of that. Yeah, I have a dream, but uh, I also would say right now, I don't know because I, I'm not there yet because I'm trying, that's what also I'm trying to solve with, uh, at least from the defensive side, uh, of what I do, I'm trying to, you know, I don't know if how familiar you are with my work, but all those zero points and, and, uh, so because I'm a, a bad person to answer that because my class is blue belts and up mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm not very, let's say, not very structured person in that sense. I'm structured in other sense, I think, when it comes to my, you know, ideas and stuff. But as programming, uh, I'm uh, I'm in a good position to have freedom in that. And I, I don't like uh, more, let's say, lower lower um, level classes because of that. That I, I would have to structure them better. Mm. And I feel my good friend Ronald that I do DVDs with, he's, he's learned, uh, he's, a, he's a physical education teacher. And I feel he's way more structured than me in that sense, because he's also taught and he's educated in there. So my classes are mostly what I feel people should have in the gym. Okay. That if I, let's say if um, I, I saw that uh, we, did, we didn't do a lot of leg locks, then we did three months leg locks, two months something else to have a break, then went back to leg locks. And that uh, we learn to teach them, and it trickles down to different groups. So, uh, and do, I do experiments. If I want to understand something, I would teach it, and so, and then we'll figure out uh, orders and stuff. And then, is it good or bad? So, I'm fortunate that I'm not pushed, uh, put in a situation where I have to evolve, and I'm definitely in my comfort zone. That uh, if somebody go like Preet, give me a, give me a year structure. That I would I would say we have it in that sense we have a base course and I think it was eight months long and then we had a main group that was the cycle was maybe two and a half years something that you know like uh, escapes and leg locks and X guard and stuff like that we thought that let let's go a little bit broader you know and then uh, when people finished that time kind of they got to the blue belt and kind of blue beltish level. But there definitely was a curriculum in that class that lasted maybe two and a half years. And then we went on and we'll see what we have to change and what can we keep. Uh, and then was my class. We just, I, I just saw kind of overall, we wanted to do always something attacks and something defensive and kind of like what's missing. Oh, we haven't, nobody, there's no system of Dars escape. So we figured out kind of mm -hmm. that maybe. Uh, and so I'm I'm a wrong person to ask that, and I, I understand my deficiency there. And but I have a, like a dream. How I would, because your example was very actually hard, and that's a struggle for coaches because uh, you know they have blue belts and purples and a couple of blacks, and then usual answer usual question is what do I teach in a class where let's say twenty blue belts, five purples. Uh, two uh, like uh, three brown belts and two black belts. What do you? What, how do you run that class? Because you're embarrassed sometimes because the, you know, the black belts are yawning, kinda, and uh, you have to look. You have to show something cool, but uh, maybe that's not good for blue belts, you know. And so what? Uh, what my? I don't know if it's the right word. The thesis or what's the other other word? Your uh, approach, your belief. Anyway. 
Yeah, so my, my hypothesis, yeah. What, what, what I'm trying to do also, and that's why I love my ideas of zero points, and I, I think they make sense, is let's say, you know, I have a position we call side control. We have a Hawking and stuff. We, we play that. Uh, and uh, the class would start. Everybody, like black belts with blue belts or whatever with each other. And everybody does this position. And then I would just go, uh, go Kimura. Yeah, let's fi let's figure out Kimura. So if you're blue belt against uh, purples, whatever, you know, you will start uh, very far away from that Kimura because purple belts have to get it and then finish. If uh, if they cannot finish, start a little bit closer to the attack and try to go to finish. So if you're against, uh, if you're blue belt, let's say if you're purple against the blue belt, maybe give them Kimura and try to get out because I, I have a method to teach Kimura defenses. Uh, it's really okay method it's not random uh, and then as you can really uh, differentiate why you win why you lose and then let's say purple against blue and then give them stuff and get out if there's a too big of the ratio of success give them less so it's still fun to get out and you're motivated and you're not getting submitted left and right all the time and then if you're a black belt against the blue belt uh, start almost like a knee slide with ankle already in. They're squeezing the ankle. You have cross, you know, underhook and stuff and good to pass and go to Kimura, you know? So you start as much far away from that Kimura, but the mm. goal is Kimura. So you you disable, you kind of like a, you create a disability for yourself. And then black belts have a very good time training with blue belts. Purples train with uh, blue, blue belts, also blue belts, uh, they like to train with higher belts because they can just not give them stuff. Then you really like use all their force and still, you know, win against yeah. purples and also give them stuff because they're training partner and, you know, whatever the goal is that class or is it finishing or is it defending? So then the whole class can have a topic of Kimura, but everybody can train their level in that sense, you know? Yeah. And I think in my, I have done those classes. I, I can do them. I don't know if I can do them everywhere with every topic. But ideally, that would be the class that everybody benefits according to the level. But then again, certain, um, I would say certain familiarity with the positions or fundamental knowledge has to be there that, uh, you know, fix the position. And then we, you know, basically 20 minutes of maybe introduction and then half an hour drills. So that usually, you know, let's say I would, how, how, would, how, 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 how you would uh, structure classes. But... Uh, and then, uh, but what else? What how Ronald is doing? Pretty much the same, I think. Some some twenty minutes, and then mostly drilling. We are uh, we're trying to uh, drill as 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 much as possible and teach um, as less as possible every class. That if you skip a class, you don't lose much, mm -hmm. and if you come to the class, you just get more drills. It's not about information, but just doing it under pressure, and you can always you know raise the resistance. So it's fun always for those people that always participate because they just get better and you can pretty much like isolate sparring in some cases if you're very good. So I feel that is the trajectory I, I would like to study and how can we do this in lower and lower, lower level. And it seems to answer a lot of questions and it makes streets a lot of fun, always sparring, always resistance sparring, and you can take that chunks and put it back to the sparring. So trans, trans, transition from the drills to the sparring is I'm not saying one on one, but you know, like pretty close mm -hmm. to similar that how you would spar, and you would pull new stuff off in a sparring with specific rules we usually have for sparring in that day. So that seems to work, and I'm trying to weed out the bugs and you know, kind of trickle down to everything we do. Uh, so that's the that's the goal, so to speak. So if that makes any sense. Well, I love the approach of treating people. <laughs> like human beings treating people, treating adults like adults who have some responsibility and ability. They have responsibility for their own learning, but they have ability to do their own learning. Um, yeah. And I, it I, makes them really engaged to process themselves. That they're they're. I think it even. I think the science supports that they're less likely to quit because they're so involved, and because they're figuring stuff out and they want bigger problems and. I think it just uh, it just makes sense. Yeah, sorry. Um, how do people train with you? I mean, you've you've worked a lot with BJJ Globetrotters over the years. You have your own yes. school. 
you have your defensive BJJ site. Maybe just tell people about those and uh, tell them how to find whatever options they have to uh, to learn more from you. Yeah, so right now traveling is off, yeah, to come to Estonia. I think we're the we have the highest numbers of whatever the ratio of infection and to the 100,000. So we're first at something. Uh, and uh, so at if the you know the all the restrictions go down and the world gets a bit back to normal, uh, people can always visit our gym. We we have not a lot of visitors, but enough, you know. I I think it gets. I think now with all the exposure, maybe I will have more visitors. And you're in Tallinn, uh, the capital. Tallinn, yeah, capital, yeah. Which I've so, heard nothing but good things about. People talk about how yeah. pretty it is. Yeah, I, I don't think if somebody just comes to the comes to the Tallinn, I only think I warned them is about uh, pirate taxis and not being drunk and two o'clock in an old town, you know, alone. So, but that's obvious. You don't do Where that. Where is that a good idea? Yeah, so that's what I mean. It's like it's I I would consider it's pretty safe in that sense that you can order Uber and you'll be fine. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm doing the I'm trying to do the, all the camps I can like club trotters. It's kind of like my addiction and uh, uh, that's how I spread and I have time to do it. Uh, I have you know substitute teachers that can take my classes and stuff. So I'm trying to do a lot of those if they're open um, these days less, but you know let's let's hope they come they come back. Also, um, what is uh, I'm defensive BGJ site is like where, where I'm usually I'm very active there, and I guess some YouTube and uh, I don't know. You asked where you can find me or something or yeah, overall. Like, well, you've you've listed your uh, you're on YouTube, you're on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, what's your Instagram handle for people? Uh, my uh, nickname is Jits Vulcan. Uh, it's like uh, Jiu Jitsu, like uh, you know Jits. Jits with hits, but uh, and then Vulcan is the Vulcan in me, the logical and not very emotional. Okay. Uh, so that's the nickname. Uh, Facebook is Jits Vulcan Prit Michelson, and so in social media I try to be active and it's kind of like I, I I'm a big fan of myself, so that's why I'm, why I'm super active in that mm -hmm. social media. I kind of fan. I'm a big fan of my own page in that sense. I do it for myself, and so I'm always kind of posting something and enjoying. And then seems like other people are are enjoying that too, so I'm I'm an easy person to reach, and if people want help, I guess I help. But I have my own kind of you know funneling system, so if somebody wants to really work with me, and then there is different things. I'm always willing to take visitors to my gym. We don't have like a I, we don't have a mat fee for visitors. Uh, if you train for a month, I guess I ask you from you money. But if you just visit for a week or two. I don't care. I think my gym wins wins out of that more also. So it's an equal deal. Some new new techniques and new ideas, and you know you come to and you take something from our mat. So so I'm pretty you know travel friendly. So so yeah. So that that's about it. You know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Preet. It uh, was a fantastic conversation. I really like uh, your approach and yeah. your your mentality about yeah. Jitsu thanks for and hierarchy. Thanks for reaching out in that sense that, you know, you're you're also kind of like, you know, the guy I see from far away, you're doing good things and, you know, posting and you're kind of famous. So it's always fun to uh, to get to know those people that are actually working hard, you know, and uh, they so I, I appreciate and, uh, you know, it's the respect comes from usually what you do, you know. So I really appreciate that uh, we had that talk and it, it means a lot to me. Hopefully, uh, in the post-COVID world, we'll meet up in, in real life one time. <laughs> yeah, true.